Yet a chay up at Polyan and as in a shiat top a hunnish lint as a fan of a chain, a kaidenate as in a lot of shite. I'm the current uh, first lady of the Napa Nation for uh, the Nez Lizer administration. Uh, I'm originally from Big Mountain, Arizona, and I've uh, lived in Tuba City a number of years. And I'm just very glad to be here with everybody. I think every family on the Navajo Nation, they've been exposed to drug use and alcohol use in their families or even with their, within their own communities. You know, it's just, uh, it's just something that we see, something that we grew up with, and it's across generations. And so when we talk about being drug free, that requires all of us to make that conscious decision even, you know, no matter what age we are, but it's better to be uh, making that decision at a young age and then just uh, sticking with that through your teenage years and all the way into adulthood. Yeah. And looking back, I see the life, the, you know, the, the decisions some of my peers have made over the years. People I've gone to school with in middle school, in junior high, in high school, and even people that I knew in college. Uh, some of them are not here anymore. And those are some of the consequences that come with uh, just, you know, getting involved with alcohol and drug abuse. So it's not the consequences of that. It's just, it's very serious. Some of the places that I've worked in the past have been in uh, youth shelters, in children's uh, shelter homes, and then even in the youth uh, correctional center there when it used to be there in Tuba City and just having worked through in, in some of those places and and those were all 18 uh, or you know youth that are 17 years and under that were in those facilities and when you you see even infants babies you know young kids and for those of us who have kids now, you know, that's really hard to think about. And you empathize, or you know, you sympathize with them and their situations. And of course, when you start reading into their, into their files about what kind of things led up to them being there, those are things that we don't want for our, our kids. So when it comes to the role of parents and in providing a home, uh, stability, and just providing the basic needs of a, for a child, you know, and that's housing, uh, food, and just a lot of love, a lot of uh, communication, a lot of encouragement. You know, those things are essential to young people. And I say that because now, uh, just working with early childhood education professionals, and even with criminal justice professionals, they'll tell you that everything stems from those first zero to eight years of life. Some of them say zero to five, zero to six, but those first uh, zero to eight years of life, it really does make a long-term impact on, a, on the lives of, of all children. And so our roles as a mom and a dad uh, is just extremely important. And I always say that the roles of a mom and a dad are the most important roles that we're ever gonna have in life, no matter what our professions are, no matter what career roles we ever have. And that's, that's just the way it's always gonna be. And so I always equate that with that. So if you can tend to the children when they're young and make sure you, all of those things all those provisions are met, then you don't really have to worry about them when they're teenagers or when they become adults, then they're the ones that are not, that won't be incarcerated. They won't be uh, involved with running with the wrong crowd or getting into drugs or alcohol use later on in life. And so that's something, you know, that's a, an important message for parents. I guess I was that little black sheep that when it came to my high school years, being in a relationship was never a priority. Um, even after I graduated from high school, I, marriage was not a priority. I wanted to uh, go on to 
I wanted to go on to college. I wanted to enjoy those years. I wanted to learn things. And, but, but the one thing I'm always grateful for is when I was in high school or even younger than that, my dad always used to tell me, you know, graduate from high school and then you're gonna go to college. And he always told me, give yourself 10 years, at least 10 years, don't get married, don't have children. Give yourself that 10 years to do anything, everything you want, you know, just to enjoy life without being married, without having to care for children. And to me, I think that's one of the best advices that he, you know, I've ever, anyone's ever given me. The last thing that parents want to hear about, right? <laughs> and that's uh, marriage and having children. And my message on that is always, you know what, when you have children from a young age, we need to really put a priority on teaching them about what a marriage really is, that's, that it should be something that's permanent, that's long-term, and especially where there's children involved. We don't need to continue this cycle of having single parent homes, divorce rates that are high, you know, all of those things. And that contributes to a lot of other problems in, in our communities. So that's, that's one thing that I always, um, that's always been, I guess I, I've always been on that soapbox. Of course, when you, when you become uh, a married person, I always say before you even have children, you should have a good you know, have a good plan about, you should already have your own home. You should have a way that you're gonna provide for them. And the most important thing I always say is you should always know what it is that you wanna teach them. You know, we always, we can't just be relying on schools or, you know, outside entities to be uh, educating our children. That's, I mean, and I always say schools are there to supplement everything else that we, we as parents should be teaching our children. And so, and that leads me to homeschooling. I mean, that's what I do. And a lot of the, we did that because of the, fl the flexibility of the scheduling. And then because we want a faith-based curriculum. And you know, faith, belief system, whatever it is, that's something that's so essential, I think, to every home. And so, and I always believe that children who grow up knowing who they are, having a structured home environment where it's very positive, encouraging, and loving. And then you pair that with praying parents who also teach them the same thing, who pray for them. And I always tell parents to pray just, you know, just, just like this, right, where they can hear them. Just, just pray for them. Let them hear you pray for them. Because I think, because that's how I grew up. I always heard my dad praying. I always, I've heard my mom's prayers and we've all heard, you know, grandparents, aunties, whoever, you know, praying for us. But the mom and the dad, when they pray for you, you remember those prayers. For the rest of your life, it stays with you. And so I always say that's where you need to put in those messagings, right? <laughs> I mean, and that's where you can always, uh, you know, when you pray, you're envisioning this person not at not where they're at in life right now you're envisioning and you're speaking to the future that you want for them and the number one rule my mom my dad they always had with us was we were never allowed to be at anybody else's home and we weren't allowed to bring anybody else to our house and so to me that was i guess that was a good thing and when i talk about marriage and kids, I always say, in a person's life, it, should, it shouldn't just go straight to raising kids. You know, you should have experience with raising animals first, raising plants before you even get to a live child, to a live person to raise. And I say that because with, with animals, right? I mean, well, actually it's plants first, plants, animals, and kids. Because with plants, you realize it takes patience. And that's where you realize how important the soil is. What, what, you know, different plants, they require different things. Some, they require more shade. 
some require more sun, some require less water, more water, all those type of things. And of course, now you, you also read um, about things like people talking uh, to plants or, you know, there's been studies that have been done where, you know, and it does work. You talk positively to a, a plant, it's just going to grow bigger and much healthier. And then even playing music, right? There's all those things that have been done. And so to me, I always think the environment, patience, all of that, and just really learning and understanding what that certain plant really needs to thrive. And you can, um, you know, you can equate that to raising a person, a child, a baby. They require certain things. And without those, that type, without a good environment, it's not going to thrive either. And then you, when you move on to animals, and the thing with animals, you know, they all have different personalities. My dad always told us, if you can, if you can manage, you know, different animals, different with different personalities, and you can learn to get along with all of them, you know, that teaches you how to interact with different people because every person, they're going to have different personalities and different attitudes, but you just can't go along, you know, just, you're going to have to still communicate with them in a certain way. And so that was always a big, a big source of teaching. And I'm glad I got those when in my life, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of home you were born into. It doesn't matter what kind of family you were born into. You can live and if you can endure and survive and, you know, get to adulthood, right? You know, we've been with maybe uh, absent parents or, you know, just coming out of a home where you're not, where you just feel like there's no support or encouragement, but the, you know, there's always, you can find mentors outside of your home. But just to get out all the way to graduating from high school, I always tell them, you know what, once you become an adult, everything's on you. It's kind of like their light at the end of the tunnel, right? It's like, just make it through childhood. And by the time you, can, you turn 18, you should be, you know, all the decisions and all the choices are going to be made by you. And that also leads me back to talking about marriages and raising children. Because one of the things that uh, even I, you know, just in my own experience, you know, and is that people get married. You know, we, we sometimes we go we get into adulthood and we think we're okay. And that's exactly how I felt. I'm okay, you know, I don't have any issues. <laughs> and then you get married and guess what happens? Things start revealing themselves. There's gonna be things that you're gonna know, find out about yourself that you just never knew existed inside of you. And they're gonna start, you know, being revealed. And if you have two, imagine you're having a husband and a wife two people and just uh, uh, with similar backgrounds on the Navajo Nation, right? We're all exposed to a lot of these things. And so when you get two people married, I always say, you know what? You can do some of this work before you're married, but especially as married people, you know, there's things that are still gonna get revealed and you're still gonna have to work and tend through those issues. And sometimes that work doesn't happen without um, outside help, right? And so when people talk about uh, counselors, therapists, all of that, that, that's something that people shouldn't shun away from. Because what happens is if, as a married couple, you don't tend to a lot of your childhood issues that all of a sudden are just crawling out of the box, it, it, it's just gonna, it's just gonna be a bigger issue an issue with when the child arrives, because with a baby, you thought you had it, you thought you had all these issues to deal with just because you were married. But when you have a baby involved in there, it's just, um, it's just way more. It's just 
you're going to realize how impatient you are. But the more people uh, restore themselves and tend to that work of um, really working to, um, I guess, you know, it, all, it involves a lot of forgiveness because we don't know that we hold all those grudges. We don't know we have all that. Sometimes we might be harboring bitterness or uh, grief or, you know, anything from way back when it's, it's here in our system somewhere. And we just try to continue to go on through each day, believing and trying to pretend that we're all okay. And it, it's just subconsciously always going to be there until the day we really uh, maybe have to have someone help us go back to tending to it. So I just want to encourage, uh, I guess, parents, anybody, even children, you know, to start thinking about some of these things and how important it is to, to do that work. Um, comparing my first two years of high school to my last two years of high school, going from Coconino High School in Flagstaff to Gray Hills Academy High School in Tuba City, and just walking into a school where there were so many programs there that were just, you know, openly telling us, teaching us about our Navajo culture and to be conversing with us in the Navajo language and just being around a lot of uh, Navajos, you know, people who are older than us, who, you know, you can communicate with them. And just to have that around you, it builds up your self-esteem and your self-confidence. Being a Navajo with your CID, right? I mean, that speaks volume. You're talking about a people with a land base where we have treaties with the uh, federal government, the United States, that puts us in a whole different category than any other minority group in the United States. And just being Navajo, you know, the people, you know, children, anybody, everybody should take pride and be grateful for the fact that we have our land base, we have our, uh, you know, we have our um, government, we have, then we retain a lot of our Navajo culture and a lot of our Navajo language. It's still here with us. And we can thank our, you know, our grandmothers, our parents, everybody, um, you know, around us who's continued to carry those teachings on. And so that's always a huge one for me. But I think right now people are seeing what the real important things are and they can determine what's a true necessity. And a lot of times it comes back down to, you know, the true thing, you know, the truly important things in life is the health and wellness of your family members and that love permeates a home and that there's a lot of teachings that can happen and communication is key and it just involves a lot of respect for one another. And so I, hopefully that's what um, children are being exposed to. And I hope in a lot of homes that, you know, some of these things that, um, that they learn or that they, you know, it, it, that it will transition their home environments into something different maybe than what it used to be before. And I hope it also makes people realize your home should be a place you really enjoy being at. <laughs> because I, I mean, some people get married to their jobs and then it's home just becomes a place you just go in to maybe eat something, sleep, shower, get out again. And people just never really invested in doing those home projects along the way. And hopefully those things are getting done too. But, you know, that's what I, I always uh, pray for, for our Navajo families, that they're really establishing their homes to be uh, a very, yeah, like a safe, um, loving environment. And so their kids can realize how important it is to um, have that. And especially for, you know, children growing up in that 
And I always think even for the grandmothers, the grandparents out there, you know, in back of their mind, that, you know, that's all they want is for, for that, for the grandchildren. So I think it's, you know, it, it should be a goal for all of us.